Okay, now that we're on the right slide, we can, we can start. It's great to be here. Thanks everybody for, for coming. And at the last session of the day, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, my name is Britt Johnston. I am the director of product for Redshift. And it's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. And we have one of our esteemed customers here. I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, I'm Sujo Isaac, senior architect with uh, Azure Yarn. So yeah, definitely we are gonna talk about uh, how to be the state of the art cloud data warehousing. So that's great. Looking forward that's to good. it. So I'll start off and, and, uh, and get us going here. Um, it's, uh, it's been a really exciting last couple days. For those of you who were not in the keynote Andy Jassy gave uh, on yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, we announced a lot of new things, and I'll be going over some of those uh, in some a little bit more detail today, to make sure that you're you're up on that. Um, you know, I understand that that many people in the audience are really thinking about or evaluating whether or not uh, they want to use Redshift. So we'll keep that in mind. The show of hands, though, for existing Redshift customers, just so I see that. Oh, it's good. Yes, they're definitely out there, which is awesome. The uh, um, let's go over kind of what we're going to cover. Um, what we want to do is make sure that you hear about uh, all the great things that we've been doing in Redshift with a little bit of a focus on some of our new announcements. We want to make sure you understand that, how that can relate to your own organizations and how you might use the technology, and then uh, help you plan on what might be your next steps uh, in doing that. And as part of that, we're also going to have uh, uh, Assure you and come up and share how they use some of the technology. So you'll get a real world example of, of, uh, of uh, uh, someone using the, the, uh, the software as part of that. You know, there, there's a few important realities that we think many people are facing that are driving uh, the work that we're doing on Redshift. One of the important ones is this continuing explosion of data. Now, I don't know about you, but I can remember talking about this for years. And I actually remember when it was kind of a future thing. There's a coming explosion of data. It was already exploding, but it was gonna be even more. And what's happening now is we're in the middle of that onslaught where the number of devices and the amount of events that are occurring that we wanna capture in our systems is, is rising dramatically. And so that explosion is very real and it's continuous. It's something that we have to deal with. So one of the things I wanna explain to you as part of our session is how that you can deal with that. The other one is we have more different types of roles or people that we're, that we're interacting with. One of the things that we see is with all this additional data, there's a desire to be able to understand it and use it. And so there's more analyst type roles that are being created uh, in many organizations. And then of course, we've got data science that wants to take that information and use it to help build machine learning models. And so the uh, collecting data for training purposes and things like that is another major uh, activity that's going on in that. So an expansion of personas is something that's there as well. And the, and the last item is really the need to speed up decision making, get answers to questions faster. You know, it's more and more the case where, where uh, the analytics is moving from reporting and, and, re and running regular reports to where online systems are using that to help drive uh, the decisions that might be uh, part of that. I think part of the examples you'll hear from Asurian really uh, uh, drives that home. Now, analytics is a huge topic. And at, uh, in AWS, we've got a, a variety of services that cover that. Uh, and we have an approach that really embraces what we call the data lake. We wanna make sure that you can take advantage of all those. So whether you uh, have needs for warehousing, big data, interactive query, operational analytics, all the various topics that are there, you know, we have a solution specifically designed to tackle that. But they also integrate together. And so uh, I wanna make sure you're aware of that. Today, we're gonna focus on Amazon Redshift within this family and how it can help you uh, interact uh, with, your, with your data lake, work, work with all your data. And we'll talk about some of the connections between that and some of the other, other services. Now, from a Redshift perspective, there's some really important trends that we're, we're seeing. The number one is migrations to the cloud. I talked to someone in the audience here that was saying they were here to learn about how to migrate from NetEza. 
And you're in good company. There's a lot of people that, are, that are, want to understand that. In fact, migrations right now are really accelerating from uh, various on-premises platforms uh, specifically, people looking to take advantage of the elasticity in the cloud. You know, we're able to build a, uh, in, in relatively short time, minutes, uh, we can build a system that can handle eight petabytes of capacity. Well, eight petabytes, to get your on-premises system that can handle eight petabytes is gonna take you a long time. Just the multiple trucks of hardware that would be required to support that are, uh, are substantial. Uh, just unloading the, uh, in the loading dock would be far longer. And so the ability to, the, those migrations are very compelling from an elasticity and, and agility perspective from your organization. The, uh, there's a, there's a, we've talked about the explosion of data, but very specifically what we're seeing from a Redshift perspective is an explosion of event data making its way into the, into the warehouse. People want to have clickstream information, security information that's aligned with their business data and so it, it, and bringing that together uh, so that you can run analytics across all of that information. You know, one of the reasons that there is that need is the ability, the rich feature that Redshift provides to join all the various types of data together, uh, including that event data makes that really compelling. So that's something that we've been uh, spending uh, a lot of time on. And the other, the other trend there is to make sure that you can do uh, the end-to-end -end analysis of that data and get insights from that. So whether that's the partnerships that we have with all kinds of BI tool vendors to do that, or even the capabilities we have internally to do things like federated query. And we'll talk a little bit about that as part of what we're doing. One of the trends we're also seeing, and, and it's really exciting for us, is, is a, uh, a, a shift, if you will, from uh, people thinking of their data warehouse as here and their data lake there, uh, and, and really bringing those together. In fact, one of the customers that we were, we were talking to about this said, oh, that's, that's just really obvious for me. We have our, our, our we, we've taken our, our data warehouse and we've taken our data lake and we now have a lake house uh, uh, as part of that. So they think of those two things as really coming together in there. And the way we build Redshift is, is with that exact concept in mind. If you, you see the uh, yellow arrow there on the screen, taking data out of your, of your data lake, when, when Redshift operates, it can go in and, and reach into the data lake and query that data at scale, in place, uh, in open formats that you might want to maintain it there. So if you need to generate that data and store it in a fashion uh, that you can use it within multiple engines or, or save it from sort of an archive or, or persistence perspective, Redshift can reach in and interact with that data along with the data that's been ingested. Uh, it also has powerful capabilities to unload data or copy data from Redshift into your data lake. And so that, that blue pipe there really represents that. So the ability to flow data in and out of your data lake at your particular, for your particular use case is something that, that Redshift really embraces and empowers you to, uh, to do. So thinking about data lake architectures, uh, there's really no conflict between that and, and, and Redshift, uh, you can use uh, Data Lake in, in an open way with data in open formats, and that can coexist quite well uh, with that. And we'll, we'll drill into that a little bit more. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the main benefits of, of, uh, of Redshift from a, uh, you know overall data warehousing perspective. The first we talked about a little bit is around uh, Data Lake and integration. I want to drill on that a little bit more. Within the family of AWS services, we have a Lake Foundation that can allow you to provide governance over your data lake. So you can set up security on information that's in your data lake stored in S3, and Redshift will understand that and then enforce that when, when users interact with that data. So you can have a security uh, model that covers not only what's in Redshift, but also what's in your data lake. 
Um, you can also do, uh, not only can you reach down and query that data directly, but you can federate queries to other data sources in the same face. And so that integration across uh, multiple services is, is very important there. Of course, you can do things like make sure uh, you can look at your logs and things within, within CloudWatch. Uh, uh, you can also integrate tightly with our uh, migration services uh, to, for doing uh, replication and, and migration of data and in, in manage that with, their, with DMS. So there's, there's many services that we integrate with uh, there. The second element is around performance. You know, one of the things we don't compromise uh, from a uh, um, standards perspective is performance. That is the number one goal in terms of the experience we want to provide for customers. And uh, it's, it's something we won't compromise on. So we will not take a, we will not build the system so it runs slower. Uh, that, that's just something we don't want to do, and, and we're, we measure ourselves on that goal on a constant basis. In fact, just before we came here, over the weekend, we ran another set of benchmarks against our own latest code and the code of the other solutions out there in, in clouds and measured that and revalidated. In fact, it even got better than 3x uh, uh, faster price performance. Uh, than the other solutions out there. So you can be quite confident that from a, va from a value perspective that we're doing the work to make sure you get great uh, uh, value from uh, your red Redshift system. We also want to make sure you're doing that at the lowest possible cost. And, and so uh, um, we are constantly trying to drive down uh, that cost uh, and, and, you know, in some cases, it's delivering more performance for the same cost. In some cases, it's delivering more performance at a fundamentally lower cost. And we'll talk some about that uh, as we go forward. Another element that's really important is ease of use and making sure that systems are easy for you to manage. The, uh, when we started out in, uh, building Redshift in 2012, the expectations around administration were really different. You know, people were used to having on-premises systems that had a small army of administrators to, to manage that very expensive and valuable asset uh, that had to be maintained and, and uh, uh, you know, cleaned and taken care of uh, in that sense. You know, with a cloud, that expectation shifts. So over time, there really is an expectation from the administrators that, hey, I want to spend my time on other activities Redshift, I want you to worry about a lot of the, the detail. And we've taken a lot of that away from, uh, uh, from in, in the system. And the way we've done that is two, at two levels. One is coming up with new algorithms that operate without any interaction. But the other one is for algorithms that are really complicated and involve some choices, creating AI that backs that. So machine learning models that, un that understand and can make wise choices choices that are as good as or better than your typical uh, administrator would uh, are, are important. A great example of that is, for example, choosing a distribution key for the data, looking at the data, understanding what the best way to organize it is, and then making recommendations around that. So as, as Redshift operates, it looks at those things, and there's an advisor that will give you tips and hints on how to improve your performance uh, as part of that. We also certainly try to make as many of those things automatic and, and by default, if you will, uh, in the system. But we're, we're not going to, we're going to be very careful about making choices that, that might affect performance uh, on your system from that uh, first point there. The other part that we really have tackled and worked on is making sure it can be scalable. Uh, there's features in, in Redshift that can allow you to scale in multiple dimensions, either whether it's the amount of data that you need to deal with, the number of queries that need to happen at the same time, the number of users that you need to support. All of those are dimensions that we were able to handle uh, a very wide uh, variety of cases. And we'll talk a little bit more about features that support that. Um, I think uh, fundamental and foundational is security, making sure that we provide you uh, integration with AWS's security capabilities, making sure we, we use all those best practices, making sure that the, that the environment that you operate in has all the appropriate 
uh, certifications are something that is also very important. So those six elements are, are, are really the foundation that we operate on. You're amongst many, many friends uh, uh, with Redshift. There's tens of thousands of users out there using that and they have usually many clusters. So imagine the number of, of data warehouses that are operating within that. This is really provides us a unique capability. In fact, no one else in the world has as many warehouses that they can go look at, look at the telemetry, understand how they're being used. So we drive our development process based on learning about those systems and how they operate. You know, I mentioned the increase in, in uh, uh, event data we, we can see that flowing into the system. You know, we're not gonna look at the contents of what's inside your, your warehouse, but we can understand how you're using, uh, how you're using the system and learn from that, and, and everybody can benefit from that, uh, from those uh, changes. Redshift started in, in, uh, in 2012 when we announced that, and really disrupted, disrupted the market. Uh, brought the price of uh, the economics of, of data warehousing to a new level. We keep driving that down. You know, there's a lot of, of, uh, of, of choices out there. We understand that. It's a very important space. Uh, we appreciate that there's those choices and we work really hard to make sure we continue to be the highest scale, lowest cost uh, uh, warehouse that's out there. And so know that we're, we're absolutely committed to that uh, in terms of our, terms of our model. The way we do that is by innovating very rapidly. And the innovations really are mind boggling that are happening. You know, if you've been watching our What's New feed, the RSS feed that we generate, it's, it seems like every day there's something that comes out. You know, we wanna make sure those are really easy for you to adopt and so try to minimize the amount of learning or, or understanding that you, you need to have around those. But one thing I would encourage you to do if you're interested in learning more and tracking what's happening with, with Redshift is on the AWS Redshift page, there's a what's new. And in there are, is basically a series of, of, of uh, uh, topics for the new things that come out. We're very careful to try to summarize those new things in a way that you can understand really easily. And so look at those what's news, uh, uh, what's news uh, um, statements as a great way to kind of keep up with something and understand whether or not it's something that you or someone on your team might need to learn more about. Now, if we look at just the, the last year, uh, we can organize kind of the work that we've done uh, along this path here. Uh, you know, some of the newest announcements like the RA3 and Aqua are right there at the top on performance. Uh, the new console which just came out and our data lake export that we just announced yesterday, you know, those are all at the front. But there's a whole series of those. I'm not gonna go through every single one of those, but I wanna highlight some of them so you understand uh, some of the innovation that we've been doing. Uh, the new console is something that we've spent quite a bit of time on. Uh, this is, if you're an administrative user or you have someone on your team that needs to be there, know that we're building this in a way that makes it really easy to administer systems. And we expect that you probably have more than one. Uh, maybe you only have one production, but you probably have a test in a dev environment that you need to maintain as well. And so these things are, de the, the console is designed to make it really easy to manage multiple of these systems. Uh, I mentioned there's an advisor in there that will look at an individual cluster and give you suggestions about how things to tune. So you really don't have to have the expertise to know exactly what's there but uh, uh, the system will tell you, hey, I'm noticing that there's some improvements that you can make here. Would you like to make this change? And then you can click on a button and, and make that change. We also want to make sure that you can uh, rapidly diagnose the system if something's uh, not behaving the way you expect it to be. You, know, you might make a code change in something and a query gets real slow because someone changes the, the query itself and, and you're not happy with the results of that. Going in and understanding where that's happening is something we want to make really easy for you. So you can look at the queries that are being executed, understand the ones that are taking a long time, drill into those and figure out, oh, this is the change that probably is causing my problem. This is why that report's running slow. And I can suggest someone make uh, an improvement on that, uh, on, that, uh, on that query. You can even go in in the console and try it. You can copy that 
Query, run it yourself, see if you can improve it, make some tweaks to that uh, on there. We also appreciate that some of the people that need to use the query editor and look at individual queries are not necessarily administrators. So one of the things that we're in the process of rolling out is a query editor that people can use uh, independent of the console. So you don't have to have console credentials to be able to use that, uh, to be able to use that query editor. Now, we've done so many of the things on that list uh, add up to a, a huge benefit. And one of the things that trying to make sure that they don't require a lot of attention on your part is fundamental. If you take a bunch of those and, 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 and look at them, uh, just in the last six months, we've improved the performance 2.35 times. That's what our, our benchmarking guys tell us. So out of the box, create a cluster, load some data, run a query. It's 2.3 times faster than it was just six months ago. That's pretty amazing. Uh, that, that, to me, that's shocking. It's a very mature system, so getting that kind of performance improvement is not easy. The way we've done that is, is by a, a mix of things. Uh, some of those are around just how we encode data and speed that up, and I'll drill into that. Others are around how our queries operate and the techniques that we use, making sure we're using the most modern uh, uh, approaches to doing join operations in, inside the system with things like Bloom filters, uh, making sure that we have a great planner that's planning the queries and, and taking into account all the capabilities of the underlying systems to, to, uh, to get performance. Uh, using things like uh, a, uh, an analytic, uh, statistics that are, uh, instead of requiring a full scan of the data, can sample and, and give you very accurate results based on, based on some science around how to do that with, uh, with, with HLL uh, statistics. These are all things all add up. You don't have to do anything to take advantage of these, and we will keep improving the system that way. Uh, our experience, most customers feel like, hey, my system just seems to get faster. Uh, and that's truth. You know, we, we run uh, our development process in such a way that those things are, thing, are benefits that you're going to see uh, and will improve the system over time. So let me talk about an interesting one that we've done. Uh, this is a, an encoding for data. It's called AZ64. You would think we would know how to encode data. This is how you take something and capture it in ones and zeros. What's encoding? We actually figured out a way to do this even better. And it's not obvious at first why we would do that, but the reason we did it is because the modern processors, the latest CPUs that are out there, and RA3 is an example of that, we'll talk about later, but the latest CPUs have new instructions that didn't exist years ago. Those new instructions let us do parallel processing inside the CPU uh, and so we can take advantage of what are called SIMD instructions and build a different kind of encoding. So believe it or not, it actually takes less disk space to store data now than it did a couple months ago, and we can process that data faster. And so uh, you can see here for different kinds of encoding compared to other very popular encoding standards, you know, we're somewhere between... Uh, 70% uh, less storage, 70% less storage, that's amazing, and, uh, and up to 70% faster in terms, of, in terms of processing that data. And so there's, there's various trade-offs in terms of doing that, but the combination of those two, you know, it's at least, it's at least less space or faster uh, in there, and it's quite dr dramatic on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the benefits there. So that's the kind of thing that we're working on constantly, trying to make, sort of challenge ourselves. How can we inject more performance into a system so it can benefit you? In this case, you're getting more performance and less storage for, in the same uh, feature. So something as, something as simple as encoding uh, can really, really benefit you. Another area that we've been pushing on is the overall architecture for warehousing. Now, when Redshift came to market, its approach was to use the fastest possible way, right? Performance being that top goal for us. And so uh, using a shared nothing, art, uh, uh, shared nothing approach provide that maximum performance. And the reason why is essentially the distance between the data and the processor is as small as you can make it. And so that, that approach has provided 
outstanding performance. There's another approach though, as the cloud has evolved and the networks within the cloud have gotten faster, it's made it possible to build systems that have uh, connected or disconnected storage. And so separation of compute and storage is something that that allowed. However, even in that case, when you put a network between all of your data and all of your compute, it really can cause some uh, scaling and performance issues. And so that is not a panacea either. And in fact, one of the reasons that we've sort of avoided going down that path is, is we did not want to build a system that got slower uh, as part of that. And that would be the approach there. What we've done is taken an approach of what we call disaggregated compute, where rather than taking the data and pulling it off disk and moving it up to the compute, we actually are taking the compute, the computation, and pushing it closer to the data. So it, it really is a revolutionary approach to, uh, to solving that problem. And uh, uh, you know, we asked ourselves how we can do this in a way that, uh, that really is revolutionary. And you know, it really took the cloud to enable this. You know, because we can take tens of thousands of customers' warehouses and run them inside a cloud service, we can now think about special ways to solve really hard problems that, that would be really difficult to do in an on-premises world. Uh, that uh, led to a couple uh, innovations. The first is our new compute node type called RA3, and it provides managed storage. It allows you to pay for storage and compute independently as, as part of that. Uh, it has uh, um, really incredible capabilities. The, one of the key points, though, is that it, it lets you take your system and size it based on your typical workload and then scale for peak workloads automatically. And you can do that in a couple different ways, and I'll talk about that. Um, this is automatic. You don't need to define any particular, uh, um, any particular uh, 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 you don't have to use any code, for example, to change or, or process to change how the storage is done. That's done automatically. So managed storage takes care of that uh, for you as part of that. So RA3 is that new uh, new node. Uh, I do want to I do want to drill into a few more uh, topics here. When you when you have an RA3 node, it's capable of of scaling out to eight petabytes. I mentioned of storage. I'm curious if there's anyone in the room that needs more than eight petabytes for their data warehouse. I don't see any hands. Um, so great. Uh, in the other session I did, actually there was hands that went up, and I went and found those people uh, because we can actually make this even bigger. But uh, you know, if if uh, most of our customers don't need that, then then we don't need to go there. But uh, uh, so the, the ability to, to scale out that capability is something that, uh, that we're very, very uh, uh, pleased to see. Now, in addition to that, we can create some very special technology, and that's uh, where Aqua comes in. We announced this yesterday as well. Aqua stands for Advanced Query Accelerator, and it is a hardware accelerated processing layer that we can build into the system. And it is what enables us to take compute uh, operations and push them down into the system. So by running uh, RA3 with Aqua, we actually can uh, uh, operate even faster. In fact, we expect this will let us operate 10 times faster. We already talked about three times. Now we're talking about 10 times faster. And we believe this is a sustainable uh, difference that we can offer uh, our customers. And the reason why this is really unique is the Aqua nodes that are in this picture here have custom hardware in them that's designed just for analytics. Uh, you know, again, because of the cloud service, we can build this kind of layer in our system and let people take advantage of it at a scale that can justify the investment for this. And so we're really excited to, uh, to be able to do this. Um, the, the inside the Aqua nodes, we're using Nitro system components, uh, and we're also using custom-made analytics processing uh, components that are in there. Uh, and so this is really exciting innovation, and we're we're excited we're we're pleased to be able to offer that. 
A couple more features I want to dive into. Federated query. Now we talked about data lakes, but in addition to reaching down into your data lake, the other thing that we hear all the time is people want to reach into their operational systems and pull data out. Uh, they, they, you know, it's a pretty obvious thing, but uh, we're hearing this more and more, and so we've built this feature. So you can sit inside Redshift, run a query, it will not only reach into your data lake, but also reach into those operational stores like Aurora PostgreSQL or RDS PostgreSQL and do a query that crosses, that spans all of that data. And it's not just pulling the data over and then processing on it. It actually will push complex operators down into those systems. So the amount of data delivered over the network is actually minimized. And that's really important. Remember, we talked about that red network pipe that was in there. We want to make sure we minimize the use of that as much as we possibly can uh, so that we get the maximum performance from the system. And so that's uh, one of the things to do that. Push the processing down. And, and take the benefits. That pattern is something that happens over and over again in terms of how we operate uh, Redshift. Another important announcement we made, uh, this was actually last week, but we talked about it also yesterday uh, in the keynote, is materialized views. This is a feature that lets you compute the answer to a query once, but then use it over and over again. Effectively, it can take a very complex query. You know, imagine a 10-way join with all kinds of computed columns and things like that in there. You can do that once and then just reuse it over and over again. And we maintain that. You can update it. So really can simplify building systems, can eliminate the need to have a data mart outside your warehouse, can eliminate the need to have a cache on the front end of your data warehouse to, to, to uh, feed multiple queries that are coming in and reuse those results. They can instead, instead be serviced from the materialized view. And so that's something that uh, uh, it, it's really going to be a fundamental building block. So it turns out one of the really cool things about materialized views is it turns something complex into something simple, a table that you can scan. Well, it turns out that Aqua hardware I talked about is really fast at scanning tables. So what, you, what we'll see uh, over time is a double benefit of where you can not only use materialized views to get to, to simplify operations and, and, and improve performance, but then we can use our hardware acceleration to make that even go faster. And so those two features together are really interesting and we're excited to see to see how we can uh, bring that there. Now, a couple other cool things to talk about. New data type. Uh, over and over again, we hear from customers that they need more uh, spatial information captured in their system. And whether that's location on a shelf or physical location on the earth or some, order, some other kind of orientation, uh, being able to have high performance Geometry processing is something that's, that's, uh, that's important. And we've done that now and brought that to market. And, and really powerful capability that, if, yeah, yeah, that you can add. So one of the things to think about in your world is, is that kind of spatial information something that you might use uh, within your own business? You know, it doesn't matter whether it's financial services or healthcare or, or retail, whatever business you're in, there's something about where things are that probably is relevant. And you can add that now into your capability. Just like we've added event data in, now you can add, you can enrich that with information about the events, that, that uh, physical location, and that can, that can lead to some powerful results. So we're excited about that, and you can, you can learn more about that. I would encourage you to go to the what's new if, uh, if that's relevant for you. Now there's a whole class of things that we've done that are important because they leverage machine learning. These are things where we've got algorithms that we want to make sure that you can use effectively. Uh, and so whether they're the ability to automa automatically analyze the, uh, the statistics related to your data, choosing distribution styles and sort keys, uh, performing automatic maintenance on, your, on the, the data in place, such as removing 
uh, you know, essentially garbage collecting from, from the in, in, internal database, making it sure you can squeeze as much space as you need out of that, automatically resorting uh, tables. All that stuff can, can get done now, and it's helped by these algorithms that we've, that we've built. I, I want to drill into one example of that, which is automatic table sort. Very interesting. You know, the traditional way to handle resorting your table is to resort the whole table. But what, what we've done is built a system that can do this really with very lim limited overhead on the running system. And the way it does that is it understands what data is hot in the system. And it can pick that particular hot data and focus only on sorting that, because that's the data that's being used. And so in this example here in the, in the picture, you know, you've got your whole data set uh, sliced up by in pieces, but it turns out the bottom slice is the only one that's really hot. Let's resort that. So we'll spend our, our, our energy sorting that data, and that will result in better performance for almost all queries uh, on the system. And of course, there may be other ones that are hot too, and we can sort those and determine the order. Anyway, those are the kinds of optimizations that we can make in the system. So now, you don't need to worry about sorting tables anymore. That's all done for you uh, uh, by the system. I talked about scaling in one of the other points here, and I want to uh, uh, drill on that. And there's a couple topics here to, to get to. The first is around the ability to scale uh, with dynamic workloads, where you've got spikes, unexpected maybe spikes, in your system. And you want to be ready for that. We've got a, a capability called concurrency scaling. And you can turn this on. Uh, it's a feature that allows you to uh, amplify the amount of resource that you have in the system by creating essentially shadow clusters that do the same thing that your primary cluster does for relatively short periods of time. So as if you have a, a growth in either the number of queries or the number of users that need to come into the system, the system can recognize that, spin up these additional clusters uh, very quickly, and then start offloading queries into those clusters. Once the spike is done, it can ramp all that stuff down, and it will do that automatically. What this really means is we can provide what virtually limitless scale in terms of that. You know, our example here, we've got um, uh, uh, benchmarks we've done here where we're running, uh, in this case, 220 concurrent queries. So 220 concurrent queries. They're all running at the same time and being serviced uh, with really outstanding performance. Uh, and so we can scale down from a small to a large number of, uh, of, uh, of query streams uh, very rapidly. And this is something that we've really worked on and refined. The, the, the change in this capability is something that, you know, for those of you who may have looked at Re uh, Redshift and wondered about this, you really need to update your data point. Just in the last year, we've improved this by 35 times uh, in terms of its performance. So something we've really focused on uh, nailing there. And so uh, you can be assured that uh, um, if you have spiky workload and you want to be able to take the spikes out of that and make it so that your users don't feel those, uh, this is a feature that can really help you uh, do that uh, successfully. Another area that I want to talk about is workload management. You know, everybody has lots of different kinds of users that use their system, and they may have different priorities in terms of, in terms of uh, what the results are. In the example I've got on the slide, we've got an ETL class of, uh, or group of ETL uh, uh, operations, and those may not be real people, maybe those are, are, are processes that operate, but we're going to think of those as a group. We've got another one that, that are, are, are analysts that are doing analytics, they're an analyzing data, running queries uh, on there, and, and they are at the normal priority. And the last one, we've got our data scientists. Now, what they're doing may be really important, but we don't want to impact the day-to-day -day running of the business with their work, so we want to prioritize them low. Not doesn't mean they won't get their work done. It just means it's not going to interrupt the, the quality of the results or the, the experience that our more important uh, workloads would have. And so by doing this, you can set up the system 
so that we can manage those workloads. And you can determine, based on your own organization, what you, what you would like to have here. You know, in this example, we have three groups of users and prioritize them there. You can pick, this is something you can decide uh, on your own. And so uh, doing workload management and having query priorities set within there is something that can really benefit you. Uh, and you can set this up so it's automatic uh, in the system. Hopefully you get from this uh, a, a real good feel for all the things that we've been working on at Redshift. You know, we, we talked about how important some of these fundamentals are around things like performance. Uh, we talked about scalability. We talked about our obsession with lowering the cost of, of uh, things there. We talked about some really exotic uh, hardware we're building to make it really go fast uh, as, uh, as part of that. So hopefully you have a great understanding of, of what Redshift is about. Uh, you can apply your use cases to uh, the, what's there. The next thing we want to move to is ask our, our uh, 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 customer to come up and share a real world example of that. So with that, Seb, would you come up and, uh, uh, and, and share his story on that? So, and thank you for, for doing that. All right, awesome. Thanks, Brett. All right, so before I start a quick overview about Asurion. So, Asurion is a leading provider of um, device insurance, warranty, and support services. We help people protect, connect, and enjoy the latest tech. Also, we serve nearly 300 million customers on a daily basis, and that too with great customer satisfaction. So now the question is, how do we do it, right? So the key differentiators are we use best-in-class technology. Um, we use real-time insights and solutions to deliver meaningful customer experience. And also, we use our global footprint to scale efficiently. So now we are talking about a um, state-of-the-art uh, platform which uh, drives insights and solutions to have a meaningful customer experience. So let's take a look at what would be the design principles that would go behind a system like that. Um, the first one is advanced analytics. So the system should support both near real-time and batch analytics. Also, from a scalability aspect, the system should be modular, like um, you should be able to swap in and swap out components without impacting the end users. Also, um, from a security and privacy aspect, the uh, system should support role-based access control, um, and the data should be always encrypted, and the uh, ability to um, kind of plan for a new privacy requirements that's coming, um, each, coming up each, every, each and every day, right? Like GDPR, CCPA. So we need to keep all those things in our mind while we design the system. Also, regarding the operational excellence, the system should be a model for that. We should have effective logging, alerting, and end-to-end um, -end, uh, automation for deployments as well. So let's take a look at the actual logical architecture which helps us drive a system which would provide real-time insights and solutions to you know, provide that um, meaningful customer experience. Um, so the system is grouped into a um, few layers, I would say, um, kind of uh, modular components. They are namely the sources, the ingestion, um, the staging, the speed layer and batch layer, and a serving layer, obviously that contains our you know, key um, data marks that we are gonna talk about today, and also the consuming side. So on the source side, typically we would be having data that is flowing in from cloud. Um, it can be an on-premise data. Also, um, as Britt mentioned, we are seeing a lot of um, increase in streaming data. So while we do have these uh, different types of sources, how do we ingest that data? So from a transactional data perspective, we would be having change data capture uh, to um, push the data that is coming in from our relational databases into the staging layer. 
and uh, we would be using some streaming methodologies to push the streaming data. We will take a deep dive into those in the upcoming slides. And definitely we would be having a staging area to hold the raw data. So this would be an S3 bucket and uh, a speed layer which would support near real time transactional data. And uh, we are talking about a batch layer which would hold the curated and catalog data, also the point in snapshots for analytics. Literally, this is the data lake. And on the data, uh, the serving layer side, we do have the data mods, SQL engines, um, APIs. On the consuming sides, uh, we would be having real-time dashboards, enterprise reports, analytical users, and uh, AI and ML programs as well. So let's take a deep dive into what are the AWS services that we use to achieve this architecture. So on the very left-hand side, we have the different sources. For example, cloud data might be in um, Arius, and also there can be a um, lot of on-premise sources, um, transactional sources like SQL servers, um, other databases, et cetera. And Obviously, the real-time events data that is coming from mobile apps and other sorts of um, streaming sources. And uh, corresponding to the two ingestion uh, methodologies that we discussed in the previous slide, we do have AWS database migration service to capture the change data that is flowing in from our transactional systems. And we use Kinesis Firehose to push um, the streaming data into the staging layer. And uh, we have an S3 bucket, uh, which would act as the staging layer. Once the data is in the staging layer, it's immediately pushed into a speed layer. And um, uh, this is an RDS instance. And uh, one critical fact we need to note over here is we're not pushing the entire incoming data into the RDS instance. It's just the critical data uh, for real-time dashboards as well as for other AI ML programs while the entire incoming ingestion data is being pushed into the bachelor, which is the data lake, obviously. Um, we do have an S3 bucket, which is the data lake bucket. Uh, how do we do that? We push that data using an Amazon EMR, uh, which holds Apache hoodie. Uh, some of you might have already had that session over here. Um, EMR 5028 supports uh, Apache hoodie. Uh, so it allows us to have upsets into S3 in real time. It's a great feature. Um, if you have some time, check it out. And uh, once the data is there, it's, uh, we use lake formation to catalog and provide access control mechanisms on top of that data. Now we are talking about the serving layer. In the serving layer, we would be having an RDS read replica uh, corresponding to the speed layer. So the whole point is that we don't want to tax the actual RDS instance. And uh, obviously, Redshift is our data mart, and we use Redshift Spectrum heavily. We will talk about that in a bit. Um, and Athena from an uh, analytical usage as well. And uh, regarding the consuming side, we have real-time dashboard, real dashboards, uh, enterprise reports, and uh, analytical users. So let's talk about the situation. Um, that, uh, that is there in most of the organizations. Um, your data mart has the latest uh, historical customer information. But there is an urgent need to find real-time customer insights on the fresh data that just came in. But you can't wait for the ETL process to run and process and update the data mart. So how do we do that, right? So this is a meaningful um, you know, situation where you need to provide value back to maybe your customers, saying that, okay, this is the latest data that we have on our file for your customer, right? So how do we do that? So the answer lies in Redshift Spectrum. So the latest data might be, um, might be a file or whatever it might be. We can load it into S3 and define a schema on top of that and easily join that data with Redshift. So the whole point is it allows us to have an extended data warehouse. Um, it has the ability to be um, very performant as well as cost effective. So uh, I believe it's only $5 per terabyte. 
And the good part is like it allows us to have security as well. Um, the lake formation allows us to have role-based access control on top of the data that is there in S3. So from a best practices aspect, um, let's talk about a couple of scenarios that Britt has already mentioned. Um, this is concurrency scaling. So this happens in our organization towards the month end. Um, this is a situation known as burst read. So um, you might be having thousands or at least hundreds of analytical users. Uh, they all want to run um, the queries on uh, the month end reporting cycle, right? So that happens on a very short period of time. So this spikes the capacity of the cluster, and most of the queries get queued and uh, tries to have a lower performance. Um, so we enabled the concurrency scaling, and it was a great boon for us. And um, we were able to serve all of the, uh, our analytical users without uh, much of an issue. And uh, another um, best practice that we have employed is automatic workload management. We all know that uh, workload management is uh, part art and part science. So you, are, you, know, you need to take the guesswork out of the equation, then give it back to Redshift. So the automatic workload management does that for you. Uh, so we figured out that this is the best thing to do for us. And uh, another great feature is security. Um, the LDAP integration, this allows us to have federation with our Active Directory. So uh, we can easily um, understand the usage patterns. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be part of the preview program for R3 instance. And uh, what we have figured out is that it provides us with a lot of cost optimization as well as performance gains. So we are really looking forward to having it in our production ecosystem. So in an overall, um, what we have seen is that in order to drive uh, real-time insights and solutions to provide meaningful customer experience, we need to have a platform that is uh, scalable, which supports advanced analytics, and is able to um, have great performance as well. So with that, uh, Britt. Thanks so much for sharing that. Sure. Uh, we want to uh, you know, make sure that, that you get, I hope, what you needed out of this discussion. We wanted to make sure you learned about the, the, many of the new announcements we have and really key technologies, understand where Redshift is going uh, and, and how that can be applied to your organization, why we're doing some of what we're doing and how that might apply to you. Uh, making sure that you understand uh, uh, a path forward, how you might plan, how you might think about migration, how you might think about building complex systems using the, uh, some of the examples that you, you saw there. Um, and you know, really for a next step, for those of you who are thinking about what to do next, getting your hands dirty, uh, playing around with RA3, build a cluster, load some data in it, start to learn how to use uh, Redshift, it really is simple. Uh, you don't have to, no truck needs to show up at your, at your uh, location. You can build an eight, if you got eight petabytes of data you don't know what to do with, we have a place to store it uh, and give you really outstanding performance uh, on your queries as, uh, as part of that. So with that, come on up on stage here and uh, we can take a few questions uh, from you. Uh, I don't know if we have mics, so maybe if you just come up here and, and come close. Uh, we can hear that. Who's going to be brave to start out with a, uh, with a question? Come on. Yes. So the, so the question was, does Redshift handle partitioning? Yeah. Um, and and the, 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 uh, the answer really is, 
you know, Redshift will partition the data and spread it out across a, a massive system, but it doesn't do it in a physical way, right? It does the logical partitioning. And on the subset of data that you'd have there. Okay, well, you know, I, I hear you. Um, you know, partitioning is, is important. Why don't we talk a little bit afterwards so I explain how we, how we deal with that problem, because it is a problem that everybody has with data. There's only a hot, there's a hot data set that we need to, to worry about. But let me, let me share a little bit more how we, how we handle that. It's, it's a little different than the physical approach uh, to, to doing that. Next question. So the question was, if I have DES2 uh, 8XL instances, uh, what, what should I think about in terms of migration? So I did another talk uh, here at the, at the conference, uh, ANT 230, and it drills into a lot more detail on how to migrate and how to size things. But I'll, I'll summarize uh, briefly for, for that, uh, that case. If you have... Uh, DS2 8XL instances, generally speaking, when you migrate, you do a two to one migration. So let's say you had eight, you would go to four, four RA3 16XLs, and you generally should experience about double the performance of your current system, double the, the storage capability of your current system for the same price. So that's, that's essentially uh, what we're delivering there. If you've got DC2 uh, 8XL interest in, uh, instances, generally the migration path is more of a three to one uh, ratio. Don't expect quite the same level of performance improvement because DC uh, already have uh, pretty hefty processors and SSDs in them. So the, the technology difference is not quite as dramatic in that case. Uh, but you'll still get, you should get performance benefits and, and a simpler system as a result of that. Um, if you've got smaller systems, 10 terabytes or less, then you, you, uh, um, you know, really uh, should think about uh, the next thing we're going to do, uh, and we talked about it here briefly, is we, we're, we'll, we'll announce a, an RA3 4XL. We've talked about it, but it's coming soon, we're working on it. We're not ready to, to, to hand that out to you yet, but that will be another option for, for smaller systems. It's basically a smaller node type built out of the same technology, and, and so we will be excited to, to share that as well. Good, next question. How small a data set? Well, as I said earlier, you really size your clusters based on the amount of compute that you need. Uh, and so you could start out with a, uh, you know, an RA3 cluster, for example, uh, with very little data in it, and it will allow you to grow that dramatically over time. You know, our guidelines are, are essentially 64 terabytes per node. And so, so when you've got a two-node system, that the guideline there is it's zero to 128 terabytes. That's a pretty big range. Um, it is the case if you have a small amount of data and that data set will remain fairly static, you might want to use one of the, the, other, the other node types to get a better cost uh, performance uh, benefit there. But you know, we can help you size that. Okay, well, we're basically out of time. Uh, we'll, we'll be here for a couple more minutes. It's the last session of the day, so no one's going to kick us out of the room. Uh, <laughs> feel free to come up and do that. Thank you so much for, for your attention, and I hope you got some benefit out of what we shared. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.